second one. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that one. Send you that again. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the change in alcohol was, but um, I'll send you. That would be really helpful. And all seems on track for MDPs. <laughs> they haven't heard my contribution yet. I might go way off piece. So let me open it. Tweet it again. Yeah. yeah. So I figured after last meeting it needs like more input to then generate more. Uh, yeah, that was quite interesting to do and hopefully it will make for a good meeting. Mm. Did you hear from many people that I'll be attending? Um, you're coming, hey. Yes, I'm coming. I'm not sure what the language will be to make it, but I shall represent. And great, <laughs> great. Um, and then Vicky <laughs> are coming, okay. yeah, and this guy Gordon, who is manager of Eco Congregations, who are kind of joining the coalition, and he's keen to get involved. Um, yeah, and then I think Fiona is away, unfortunately. So, I can't remember what her outfit is said. Um, but yeah, and then. Robin, I think, is going to come. And I'm not sure about.
Okay, I think everyone's settling in now and um, hopefully everyone has made use of the fruit that's available and um, if you haven't yet, please do help yourselves. Um, welcome everyone, my name is Greg McNee, I'm the Head of External Affairs with Cancer Research UK. Um, I'll be trying to keep our session to time and making sure um, you guys and the audience can participate and contribute as much as possible to this session. Um, so this is hosted by Voluntary Health Scotland and is on the subject of obesity and I think I've been set three aims and, and hopefully together we can help um, match those three aims for the session and one of those is around defining what obesity means for us. So that's um, as a third sector and, and on behalf of all your organisations, what impact is obesity having in, in your world, your services and um, the broader impact across Scottish society. It'd be good to then explore some angles of attack on this problem. It's, we hear often enough it's multifactorial and the response has to be multifactorial, so I think this is a session where, where you, the audience, and, and our panellists indeed can, can help come with some angles of attack on that. Um, and then more broadly, hopefully um, through that conversation and interaction, we can come out with an initial third sector response to the obesity challenge that Scotland faces. So um, what can we as a sector really offer um, the obesity problem? Um, the session will be written up by Voluntary Health Scotland and um, a set of key messages and, and notes will be distributed to everyone after the meeting. Um, some of you will notice at the back that Claire is fiercely cartooning this, is that what it's called? Um, there's a cartoon document of the session going on. I'm not sure who the first figure is meant to represent, but it's, it's an excellent one. Um, so that will be on, on record as well. Um, I'm good, going to introduce our first um, our <coughs> panel and then our first speaker. Um, so starting with the panel, on my right, your um, far left, um, we've got um, Bella Crow, who's a policy officer with Nourish Scotland. Bella, do you want to give a wave or use some body language to show how excited <laughs> you are to be here? Um, Very much so. Dr Anna Gricka, who's a policy officer with Obesity Action Scotland. We've got um, Drew Walker, um, who's Director of Public Health at NHS Tayside, poised to um, make the first presentation. Um, Alison Douglas, <coughs> next to me, is the Chief Executive of Alcohol Focus Scotland. Um, now, what we plan to do is have <coughs> Drew um, setting the scene for about 10 minutes, giving a background from an NHS perspective on the, the obesity challenge. Um, we'll then hear about three minutes each. Um, I say about, it's a very strict three minutes each from each of the panel. Um, and then from there, we hope that will generate some interest and questions which um, I'll help field um, from the chair. Um, so from there, I'm going to pass over to Drew to, to introduce. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real privilege to be here uh, with you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about tackling our obesity epidemic. As Greg has said, uh, I'm the Director of Public Health in Tayside. I'm also the Director of Public Health Lead uh, on Obesity uh, for Scotland, and I recently led uh, part of the consultation on the government's obesity uh, strategy uh, across uh, Scotland, recently uh, completed just up until the end of, uh, of January. Uh, Tayside was the first uh, place in, uh, in the UK to publish a healthy weight strategy about 13 or 14 years ago. And related to uh, the agenda uh, today, we were also the first uh, place in the UK uh, to publish a health equity strategy in, uh, in 2010. And all of that is very relevant to what I'm going to be uh, saying today. Um, uh, we face a major uh, uh, challenge here in, in, in Scotland, and that challenge is, is underpinned by a culture uh, around eating and around physical activity. Uh, but also around an environment which uh, is perfectly designed uh, to create and maintain and increase uh, uh, obesity. Um, and this, uh, when I was young, uh, would have been a, a relatively rare thing. This is now uh, very common, uh, and uh, the two-thirds two, two of the adult population uh, of Scotland is now overweight uh, or obese. So it's not just one or two people that uh, there's long time no see. Um, the medical complications of obesity, you probably have heard some of this, uh, but I think it's important to emphasize just what a devastating uh, impact obesity can have on our health. People, somebody was asking me recently, are there any body systems 
uh, which are not affected adversely uh, by obesity? And the simple answer is uh, not really. Uh, it, is, uh, it affects adversely almost every part of, uh, of our body. So it's not a surprise uh, that it is now, obesity is now the single, single biggest public health challenge uh, that, uh, that we face. And, this is, and it's not just a challenge for public health, it's a very much a challenge for the NHS. 9% uh, of uh, the NHS spend in Scotland that's over a billion pounds a year is just spent in, uh, in treating type 2 uh, diabetes. In Tayside alone, uh, that's over uh, 80 million pounds. And, uh, and type 2 diabetes is, is not always, but invariably, uh, related to uh, obesity. Um, if we just, I was talking about two thirds of the population being overweight or obese, it's slightly more common. Uh, in men than, uh, than, than in women, uh, but not, uh, not all that, uh, that different. Uh, and I talked about our health equity strategy, and that, that's very relevant in, in this slide. Uh, this slide is showing that in the least deprived areas compared with the most deprived areas, obesity is about half as common uh, in uh, relatively affluent people uh, compared with uh, more affluent people. Um, and this is in, in children at, uh, at school entry, but also in, uh, in primary, uh, primary six. And you can see, uh, not only is there a doubling from least to most deprived, but there's a doubling uh, from primary one uh, up to uh, primary six. Uh, and the, the other thing to say about this is it's actually getting worse. The, the divide between uh, affluent uh, and, and poor uh, is continuing to grow, particularly in, uh, in children. Uh, and in adults as well, there is a, an obesity gradient related to, uh, to poverty. It's more, um, it's more marked in, uh, in women than in, in men, but it's there in, in uh, men and, and women. So we have, uh, we're right in the middle of an obesity epidemic. People are comforting themselves that it's not going up as fast as it, it was, and that's certainly true. Uh, but it is going up more in people from poor areas than it is in, in people from more affluent uh, areas. So we should still be very, very concerned uh, about it. The, the document I talked about, the government's consultation document called Action and Ambitions on Diet Activity and Healthy Weight. I, for shorthand, I call it its obesity strategy. Um, some people don't, uh, don't like that. Um, but... Uh, uh, we've just completed the consultation. Uh, going, I've been going around Scotland and speaking to literally hundreds of people about, uh, about this. And the level of concern and the level of enthusiasm for doing something now is quite palpable. When I first took a healthy weight strategy to our board in Tayside 13 or 14 years ago, I was criticised by some of my board members for wasting my time, the time of my staff and time for other people in preparing something which was really about personal uh, choice and didn't have anything to do with public health. You would never, ever get that kind of comment uh, now. So we've, uh, we've moved on. And in the document, it recognised that we need to learn some lessons from the obesity route map, uh, which was published uh, a few years ago, and people have been trying to implement it. It's had some impact, but it's been uh, limited. And there's been a recognition that uh, we need to uh, broaden the range of, of interventions, that focusing on personal choice is important, but it's not nearly uh, sufficient. We need to do something to change the environment that I said is perfectly designed to create and maintain obesity. And we need to find ways to make the healthy choice uh, uh, the easy choice. Now, I'm assuming, uh, I think you've all had access to the consultation document. If you've read it, that's great. And the next slides I'm going to be showing will be quite familiar with you, the, the, the territory that I'm going to cover. If you haven't read it, please do. It's an easy read. It's not a great big, long, heavy uh, tome. Um, and I think at the end of it, you'll understand uh, much better not only what the problem we're facing, but the um, crucial contribution uh, that the third sector, the voluntary sector, that charities can play in, in tackling obesity. And I'll come back to that uh, towards the end of my presentation. And it's about transforming the, the, the food uh, environment. Uh, these are just headings that are taken uh, from, the, from the document itself. But we know there are so many things wrong with the food environment uh, that is uh, around us. 
uh, the marketing, the encouragement, the access we have to the to the wrong uh, to the wrong things in so many different places in so many different ways. Uh, I walked here from the from the station today, and um, I, I was very very conscious that I was walking through. Uh, what I would call an obesogenic environment. Uh, at least I was taking some exercise uh, and not consuming half the stuff that was uh, uh, in my face as I was coming across. But lots of people find that a very challenging environment to, uh, to uh, navigate through. Uh, we need to be, uh, we do need to tackle health inequalities. We need to change our relationship with food. We do need to help people who are, uh, who are already uh, overweight uh, or, or obese. And the whole nation needs to become more active uh, uh, more often. Not just because of obesity, because there's, but there's a huge evidence around the mental well-being uh, benefits that can come out of increased uh, physical activity. And the third really key part of the, of the document is about um, uh, leadership and exemplary practice. Um, government and local authorities and the NHS have, have been saying for a while now, oh, we need to... Um, and we need to do something about this obesity epidemic. And yet, in their own practices, in their own environments, uh, they're, not, uh, uh, they're, they're not doing uh, what it says on the, on the tin. Uh, in my own organization, NHS Tayside, if you go into Ninewells Hospital, if ever you want to see an obesogenic environment, try walking into the main door of, uh, of Ninewells Hospital. You can't move uh, for stuff that's going to make you uh, put on uh, weight. So leading by example is a really key issue uh, for the public sector and for the third sector, whether it's uh, charities or, uh, or volunteer organisations. So I just want to really finish, I, I, and this is very much a whistle-stop tour, and I'm trying to cover a lot in, in uh, 10 minutes. I just wanted to emphasise one of the changes in culture is amongst the medical profession. I'm a doctor uh, myself, and, and I know that doctors until very recently uh, didn't see... Uh, um, obesity is an issue, neither did they see public and, and patient in, involvement in looking after their own health as a, as a big issue. But this is a, a page taken from the British Medical Journal, um, and it's an article about, uh, essentially about uh, co-production, co-creating uh, health. Uh, and when the British Medical Journal starts talking about that and putting it on their, uh, on their front pages, then we know we're actually getting something somewhere with the NHS. And I think there is an appetite amongst the medical profession, other people in the health professions, and right across the public sector, uh, for people to co-create and co-produce uh, the, um, the change that we're looking for. And uh, that's why I, I referred to our health equity strategy uh, uh, that we published in, in 2010. And we put co-production right down the centre of that. And we put the role of the third sector, of charities and of uh, uh, voluntary organisations right down the centre of that. Who's better placed to lead and, and contribute to this co-production effort than the uh, third sector? And yet the opportunities that are created for the third sector to, to do that are far more limited than I or you uh, would want that uh, to be. And co-production is something, when, when, I, when we published our health equity strategy eight years ago now, we talked about co-production and it was like, uh, it might as well have been Swahili I was talking, uh, because people just didn't understand what it was about. It's now become part uh, of the standard dialogue within the services that I'm, uh, that I'm working with. And I just wanted to finish on the, the, the last uh, words that were in our health equity strategy, that people are the heart of the solution and not the problem. I know that everybody in this room believes that, but we need to infect other people who are more resistant to this idea, who don't think necessarily uh, that uh, co-production, co-creating health uh, is the way ahead. We need to push them into the minority and we need to be encouraging and facilitating this becoming the way that we do things uh, in Scotland, the way that we change things, because all of us uh, stand to benefit from that. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, too, for an excellent and really comprehensive introduction there. That will have likely sparked a few thoughts and questions from the audience. I'm going to ask you to hold those, and we'll um, move to the panel now, and I'll invite Drew to join us. Um, so the remaining three panellists are each going to speak for three minutes on um, why obesity is particularly important to, to their working agenda and um, what they are doing to, to challenge obesity. I'm going to kick off with Bella Crow from Nourish Scotland. Great. Hi. Um, yeah, so as Drew mentioned, we've seen this shift where obesity has gone from being seen as a personal problem of individual choice to a kind of broader focus on our food environment. I think at Nourish Scotland, we'd like to broaden that focus even further and think about the whole food system. And I'd like to ask a question that you can all think about of what is our food system for? Because at the moment, we've got different food affects so many areas of government, from, from public health to social justice to the environment to our rural economy. And different areas are having, have different priorities. And at the moment, or for a long time, we've seen the priorities of rural economy, the priorities of the food and drink team um, to, around the export agenda. So the, their focus for the food system, their priority for the food system is to sell more, to make sure that Scotland's economic success around food is, continues. And it has been a, a remarkable economic success story. But what I think is going to be a really interesting challenge when thinking about the obesity agenda, the public health challenges more broadly that we see with our food system, is working out how we can create a whole of government and whole of society approach to this problem. Um, and it's not like they're all going to be competing interests. We've got a lot of synergies. We know that actually a healthy diet is also broadly a more environmentally sustainable and um, a healthy diet and, and a sort of different composition of the food system with more involvement from people, whether that's through growing or community meals, can lead to significant benefits way beyond the public health agenda um, in terms of, well, in, in terms of communities and well-being. Um, yeah, so I think it's really interesting that we've, that we've got this attention on, the, on obesity and public health right now. Um, I think it's really important that we also then make the links to our whole food system. If we've got farming in Scotland that isn't focused on producing good food for people and nourishing people, um, but is focused on you know, exports, then we're not going to create the whole food system that is going to be nourishing for the population. And I think it's, so how do we make the shift? How do we create the whole of food system transformation? I think a really crucial area is governance and um, really, value hearing Drew's centering of co-production because I think that's going to be key that this involves all of us. But that means we have to design some really innovative governance mechanisms to make sure that it's not just the food industry, it's not just um, the farming sector that have the ear of government on this. Um, and I think that's a real challenge because those sorts of governance mechanisms don't really exist. Um, there aren't that many models for Scotland to follow. There's a few different examples from different countries around the world and different sectors. Um, so, but I think it's a really exciting challenge. Um, and right now in Scotland, we've got a commitment to introducing a Good Food Nation bill. So the Scottish Government have recognised that more needs to be done to draw together these disparate agendas towards food and think about how we collectively work together to become a Good Food Nation, which is really great. Um, and it's, you know, Scotland have led the way. They've led the way in the UK for food policy um, and they're continuing to do that. Uh, yeah, so really encourage everyone to keep up the pressure on the Good Food Nation Bill because it's been a bit of a slow burner and really excited to see what comes next. Thanks, Bella. That's really helpful exposure to even more wider agendas that are all competing in this um, very complex environment. So it's, um, helpful lens expansion there. Um, I'm going to move now to Anna from Beastie Action Scotland. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. 
Um, so I work as a policy officer for Obesity Action Scotland and um, obesity is a very big public health problem and it's great to see uh, everyone interested sitting here uh, this afternoon uh, in, the, in this session. Um, and there are so many reasons why, why it is important to tackle this problem from the cost for the NHS, the cost for the wider economy, uh, the discomfort for people experiencing it. Let's remember it's one in every three people that are affected by obesity in Scotland. And that not only m means increased risk of cancer, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but it's discomfort in, um, in everyday life, maybe breathing problems, sexual health problems, social interactions, mood, so many things, and, and also shor shorter lifespan for people affected with obesity. So it's really important that we do something about it. So um, Obesity Action Scotland is an independent advocacy group we represent clinical voice on obesity. We aim to raise awareness of obesity uh, and awareness of uh, the, the reasons why, why we have obesity problem. We uh, aim to um, identify and pursue prevention strategies um, and also uh, promote well-being and healthy weight. And we work with uh, organisations in Scotland doing that and uh, in the UK and I recognise here quite a few friendly faces from organisations that we work with um, and we work through uh, political, political engagement, we meet and we influence MSPs, we have we provide information on our website, there's a wealth of information every day on Twitter, you'll find lots of, lots of tweets from us about this. On our website you will find briefings on different topics related to obesity, specifically in Scottish, Scottish, um, Scottish angle, um, fact sheets. Um, lots of videos from the members of uh, our steering group who are experts in different areas of obesity uh, in Scotland. Um, we run uh, campaigns such as we worked with, for example, um, CRUK uh, on uh, Obesity and Cancer Week last October. Um, um, we had a campaign on healthy school meals last year as well. And, uh, and also we provide commentary on, uh, on obesity issues in Scotland. And finally, I would like to say that we're aware of the importance of working with others, uh, of networks, uh, of alliances. So we are part of the Scottish Food Coalition, where we work with, with Norwich Scotland, for example, and other organisations. Um, we are part of Scott Health Alliance, working with uh, Alison Alcohol Focus Scotland and Arsh Scotland. Um, and also, we are hoping to launch Obesity Alliance in Scotland this year. There was an appetite for such alliance almost two years ago, and now we have an opportunity to start taking this work forward and start it. So, um, watch this space, and in Obesity Action Scotland newsletter, we'll be putting up uh, um, updates on this work. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, and hopefully for maybe a couple of you in the room that's um, new um, information about the Alliance and that Obesity Action Scotland does exist as a sector umbrella, so I'm sure Anna's open to anyone who's interested in becoming involved. Um, I'm going to move to Alison now, who's Chief Exec of Alcohol Focus Scotland. Thanks, Gregor. I'm delighted that uh, uh, Voluntary Health Scotland have joined the dots between obesity and alcohol because so often that, that doesn't happen. Um, so I just wanted to sort of highlight three eyes that I think are, are relevant to, to that kind of uh, um, discussion. So the first is the interconnection and, and that's really about recognising the role that alcohol plays in diet and obesity. So a glass of wine is equivalent to eating a donut. Um, how many of us would go out and eat three donuts of a night? But very many of us, unfortunately, will go out and drink three, three glasses of wine or perhaps even, even more. So the average wine drinker is uh, consuming 2,000 calories a month. Um, and uh, people who are drinking within the uh, recommended limits, if you were drinking six pints of beer, for example, that would be an excess of 4,300 calories, which is equivalent, uh, again, to 23 donuts. So the UK Diet and Nutrition Survey um, identified that adults who do drink are consuming about 8.5% of their calorie intake from alcohol. And yet, um, when we look at the eat well plate or the, the Scottish dietary goals, alcohol is missing in that conversation and that discussion. 
So unless we make alcohol part of the picture and we help people to understand the contribution to their diet, then we're, we're not helping people to make healthy choices. Um, around about 10% of non-milk extrinsic sugars are coming from alcohol for, for those who drink. So moving on then to my second eye, the impacts. Um, we've heard that one in three people are overweight, one in four people are drinking above the recommended drinking guidelines. And what we see is that both alcohol and obesity are amongst the, the most serious risk factors for non-communicable diseases, which are the things that are causing the greatest health harms in, in Scotland. So that's things like cancer, heart disease, stroke. So all of these things, these risk factors are things that we can control and that we can uh, support people to avoid taking those risks unnecessarily. I suppose one other thing that I wanted to uh, highlight was about the link to inequality. So in, in terms of alcohol and the burden of disease, you're six times more likely to die and you're nine times more likely to be hospitalised if you're in our most deprived communities. So uh, I think those, those links are also very, very clear there in terms of obesity. And the trends are going in the wrong direction and that impact uh, and that differential between uh, our most and least deprived communities is increasing. So my third and final I is around the interventions and Drew talked about the obesogenic environment. It's clear that we're also living in an alcogenic environment and I think the fact that we don't necessarily think about the interplay between these different policies sometimes gets in the way. So um, if we think about one of the areas of progress in relation to alcohol, it was to ensure that alcohol was only for sale in the alcohol aisle of the supermarket. So we now walk into our shops and instead of being faced with uh, crates of beer or bottles of wine, we're faced with big bucket, buckets of sweets. So we've kind of replaced one problem with another and that's just a sort of minor illustration of the fact that we know what works. It's action to increase the price, um, to reduce the availability and to restrict marketing. Those are the whole population interventions that we know will have the, the greatest impact both on alcohol and on uh, unhealthy foods. And we need to be joining the dots more around that. And that's where some of the work that we're doing uh, collectively with Obesity Action Scotland and others is, is enabling us to look across that. So we don't, we don't make policy once and persuade uh, the decision makers once on alcohol and then a separate time on unhealthy foods. We think of this as how do we create the environment in which it's easier for people to make positive choices about their health and well-being and that we're addressing in particular uh, the, uh, the challenges that our uh, people living in our most deprived communities are facing because that's where the density of these unhealthy offerings is to be found. Thanks very much, Alison, and um, some very helpful issues raised there. I suspect a lot of the um, facts you were um, communicating there would be very low in terms of public awareness, so always helpful to, to remind of some of those. Um, I should have said earlier, for those of you on social media, we've got a couple of handles and hashtags on the go. The handles are at bhscoms, at scbo tweet, and then the hashtags, I think I've got that right way around, is um, healthy weight or scbo gathering. Um, so now I'm going to open up to the audience for questions or comments on the panel and contributions so far. So um, can I get hands up for anyone who has any questions or comments to make? Thank you very much. There'll be a microphone going round so you can just hold fire until that arrives. Jenny's going to shoot around us just at the far left, my far left there. Um, and if you could say who you are um, and what organisation you're with, if you're with an organisation, just so where your perspective is coming from. Hi, my name's Donna Curlis, and I'm not with any organisation. I'm here independently. Um, I've listened to everything that everybody said, great um, talks. And obviously, yeah, everyone recognises it's an issue. How to stop that? For example, when I was in Vietnam last year, you'd go in a coffee shop, and it was very difficult to try to find a 
coffee shop with cakes or chocolates. And as you say, we have the culture of, of all coffee shops and cakes. And I know we can't just suddenly change everything dramatically. Um, and the same as we spoke of hospital and going into the hospital and there's lots of like, you know, Smiths and chocolate stalls and cakes and mayonnaise sandwiches, etc. And then also thinking of hospital food or school food, you know, how nutritious and non-processed is that? Because another issue, of course, is processed food, which there's a, a link there, I do believe, with cancer, with a lot of processed type foods. And I'm just wondering about the change for everybody. Would it start with the school meals to an extent? Could there be things brought in there that's not so unhealthy or... And the same for hospital food, you know, all these different things as well. And, and going into a hospital, if people know that in the hospital, actually, they're not going to be able to buy all these sort of goodies, and inverted commas. OK, thank you. That's two areas you're um, highlighting there. I'm going to point... I'm going to first single a couple of panellists who I know have expertise in particular areas. So I know Obesity Action Scotland done a bit of work around schools, and Drew, I think you'll be able to come out in the hospital environment. And then other panellists, just let me know if you want to chip in. Um, yes, yeah, we did. We did look at the school meals um, last year, and we uh, we just looked at the menus published on local authorities' websites, so information available to everyone. And we looked at how many times a week ch children get chips and processed food, um, and we found out that they are served puddings more often than soup. And half of the kids are getting choice whether they will have soup or pudding. I mean, what would you choose if you were seven? Um, so there's definitely things to do there. The school meals regulations are being reviewed at the moment. So hopefully this will be changing. Also, the consultation documents um, has got this leadership uh, part uh, when uh, public sector uh, leadership is discussed. So uh, looking at hospitals and looking at schools, looking at all the public sector, uh, there people, you know, this is being discussed, it's being spoken uh, at the moment. And I guess it's not where we start. We have to start everywhere. It's not just one thing that we have to start doing. Thanks. And if I could just say something also about the uh, school meals. The, the government uh, at the time, uh, over a decade ago, introduced a thing called Hungry for Success in, in schools where they were uh, responding to adverse publicity, uh, some of it from uh, Jamie, whatever his name is. Uh, uh, and uh, they changed the, the nature of the offering to, uh, to uh, children at school uh, through Hungry for Success towards a healthier diet. So if you think it's bad now, you should have seen it uh, 10 or, or 15 years ago. Unfortunately, one of the consequences of them uh, shifting to Hungry for Success was a very significant drop-off. Uh, in, uh, in people taking uh, school, uh, school meals. So what we have to find is a complex solution uh, for uh, school children which will uh, encourage them to eat healthily but also to encourage them to uh, consume school meals rather than going down into town for a bag of chips, which is often what, what happens. Just turning to NHS hospitals, the, there has been a, a retail standard for NHS hospitals for a number of years now, uh, but to be honest, the bar has been set so low uh, for that that uh, almost anything uh, can, uh, can get over it. Uh, that's being tightened up, the bar is being raised, um, all uh, catering facilities in, in Scotland will be required to uh, meet that standard, but in my view, it's still not uh, high, high enough. So. Um, although NHS Tayside and Nine Wells Hospital I mentioned um, is still a pretty uh, poor environment uh, in terms of uh, encouraging a healthy, a healthy weight, it actually just about passes the, and gets over uh, the bar and it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be able to. And this comes back to the point that was made in the consultation document uh, which is about the public sector leadership and I guess third sector leadership as well, standing up and being counted and actually uh, doing what we can expect them to do and to show some leadership because that's been distinctly lacking. Uh, there, is, there has been very little high-level 
um, organisational leadership from the public sector around obesity, uh, despite the uh, rise in, in concerns, despite the fact that the public attitudes surveys which have just been published show that the public would support um, fairly uh, radical changes to that obesogenic environment. Um, the public sector leadership is several steps behind where the public is. And all of us here have an opportunity uh, to change that, to, uh, to lobby uh, for, uh, for these changes, to, to, to put pressure on, to complain about the environments that are uh, around us, because public sector leaders are, do respond to those kinds of pressures. They may not respond to the epidemiology that I'm presenting them with, but they will respond to pressure from people like, like, uh, like yourselves. Thanks, Drew. There's a call to action for all of us. I've got um, a few more audience who might to come in. There's a chap on my far right there who's got his hand up. Um, I'll take this lady next. Hi there. I'm Jim Boyd from Scottish Sports Futures, and I run a, a healthy weight programme for children aged 7 to 13. The point I was wanting to make here was uh, I, I totally agree. I think the, the higher level macro strategic materials first class and you're hitting a lot of issues. So the issue that I see is when you bring that down to actual turning it into op effective operational and practical delivery. And what I'm finding there, I agree we lack a number of strategic champions, I would call them, to promote and to actually look at proper cohesive collaborative working that brings together education. You speak about the, 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 the obesogenic environments, but if you look at education, curriculum for excellence, the health and wellbeing indicators and benchmarks that they have, but if a teacher passes that on to a skilled nurse, it's passed on to a skilled nurse who passes it on to a third sector community health and wellbeing programme. It's as if they're prescribing a pill and then come back and tell me in 10 weeks' time how you got on our programme's 10 weeks. Or they think they'll pass it to myself and I have a packet of pixie dust in my back pocket and that'll affect everything. The issue is very complex. The area I work in is, is some of the most deprived SMID areas that exist. So therefore, the vulnerabilities that these families have, being above a healthy weight or obese, is one, very often not the most pressing in their eyes. We need to tackle it. And what I find very frustrating is there's a lack of a strategic framework between health, education and the third sector. It brings all that support and reinforcement together. Because the reality is, in terms of all the other things, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And then perception is truth. If you change the perceptions that many of these people have, then we'll have a longer lasting result. And I think there's a gap just now in terms of everyone is working on silos, even clinically within the health service, passing it on. And there's a lack of, particularly the most vulnerable families, a lack of a collaborative framework is what my experience is. Thank you for that. I'll just ask the panel to hold on a second. We'll take the next question while we're on the move. Hi, I'm Jennifer Fingland from Cycling Scotland. A really valued contribution from the panel, but one thing I think has been missing from the discussion today is about physical activity. All of the contributions are focused largely on food, and physical activity does, or physical inactivity, should I say, has a significant impact on the NCDs that have been mentioned. And if we could increase levels of physical activity at a young age in school, that will then feed into adulthood, and adults will become more active, which will help impact impact on obesity as well. And a way to do that would be again around the alcoholic environments, making environments more friendly for like walking and cycling and promoting physical activity so it becomes the easy and the only choice. So you think, oh, I'll walk or cycle to the bus stop or I'll walk and cycle to work rather than go, oh, I'll jump in my car. So I think physical activity should feature in discussions around obesity and it should be considered alongside food, not, not separately. Thank you very much. Physical activity was on my list as well. Um, I see another hand there, which I'll come back to later. So. Um, our colleague from Scottish Sports Futures, um, what I noted was um, the question about tra strategic translation. So this high level stuff looks good. How do we get it working on the ground? And then the, the, co the coherence of support. How do we get agencies, often public sector agencies, working together coherently, um, including third sector? Um, so who wants to start wrestling with that one first? Anna, yeah. Yes, uh, I, I'll start with uh, what Jim was speaking about. I can only agree with him about the need for strategic framework 
and working together. Um, this is actually one of the points that we have made in our response to the uh, to the consultation on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the diet and obesity strategy. Um, that we need frameworks so that everyone knows what their role is in tackling this. So to be confident that what you do is 100% and that your colleague will do their 100% and it, everyone together will have a role to do. We have seen example of this in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a place when we have seen decrease in childhood obesity during the first three years of their programme. Uh, which is quite remarkable because the biggest decrease in childhood obesity was especially in deprived areas and they have done a lot of things. First thing was quite strong leadership, um, political le leadership, uh, quite strong commitment to it, um, tackling areas where that need help most. Um, so all these things are absolutely important. When it comes to um, physical uh, activity, um, it is in the consultation, uh, absolutely, and it is a part of the solution. Um, for individuals, physical activity might be absolutely what will achieve it. There is limited evidence that on population level, physical activity will, will solve it. It has to be with uh, tackling diet as well. So absolutely, those two things uh, together will have much bigger chance of success than, 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 uh, than anyone. Thanks, Anna. Taking all at once, um, I'll let Bella in next. Um, yeah, I was going to bring up the Amsterdam example as well. Another thing that they did there was make sure that obesity, the obesity challenge was for everyone who was working in government and local government in Amsterdam. So it wasn't just segregated into public health. It was, it was on everyone's agenda. And, and then they had working groups involving third sector and community initiatives and yeah really exciting model to follow and just on the cycling environment yeah I agree with Anna that food has to be and diet has to be a really primary role but they can go together really well and I think it's can be quite it's it's quite interesting in terms of our planning environment and what decisions we're making at the moment um, whether how much investment we're doing in, for infrastructure projects that are still for cars and for modes of transport that we want to be moving away from. So I think there's like, we really need some stronger leadership in terms of what do we think is the future of our high streets and our travel in Scotland. And yeah, totally linking this up with the public health challenge. Thank you. I think Alison was going to come in as well. Yeah, and it's, it's just linking to Bella's point about um, our high streets and uh, the fact that in relation to unhealthy food and alcohol, we've got multi-million uh, pound industries who uh, have a very direct interest in driving consumption of these unhealthy products. Um, and we've seen again and again the failure of a self-regulation approach to, to dealing with that. Um, you know, you go into WH Smith's to buy a magazine or a paper and you're offered a huge chocolate bar for a pound. Um, a smaller chocolate bar costs you more than that. So, you know, we're constantly in temptation's way. We're constantly being encouraged to see these uh, discretionary products as part of our everyday uh, diet. And so that's why I think part of the, the solution here, a, a significant part of it has to be uh, uh, legislative interventions um, that take uh, some of that, uh, um, that control away from uh, the retailers and from the producers who, are, who, who have a, an interest in making us unwell. Thanks, Alison. And final word on these ones from Drew. Thanks. So I, I plead guilty to not having given enough emphasis to the physical activity uh, side of things in my presentation. But in fairness, the, the consultation document does a lot on that in terms of promoting uh, physical activity, addressing sedentary behaviour, encouraging, changing the environment to, uh, to make it more, uh, more amenable to uh, active travel and uh, and so on. So there, there is a lot in there. And again, I, if any of you have not read it, please, please do that. Um, and um, I just want to also say, in terms of the, the consultation document, it is rec it's really strong all the way through. 
about this idea of champions, about, lead, about uh, public sector leadership. It has, it's a real recognition that's been lacking. And however much uh, uh, we all uh, work away and try and do our own, our own thing, unless that, uh, uh, that leadership is there from the people at the top of the various different relevant organisations are committing themselves to this, uh, then we're going to be quite limited in what uh, we achieve. I just wanted to talk about the, uh, the example you were giving of, about uh, children being uh, given a kind of exercise pill. Um, and um, I, I, one of the things that I, um, perhaps isn't emphasised as much as it could have been uh, in the consultation document is the role of what we call social prescribing. At the moment, if you go to your doctor, uh, health worker, with a problem, uh, the, the standard thing is to walk away with a, a prescription in your hand, usually for a, a medication. Social prescribing is about uh, coming away, not necessarily with a piece of paper or a prescription in your hand, but having been prescribed an opportunity to engage in uh, an, a non-medication-based uh, intervention, usually involving uh, uh, some sort of physical activity or a healthy eating initiative or uh, contact with, uh, uh, with other people to pr promote uh, well-being. We call that uh, social prescribing uh, and it is in its infancy in Scotland. There's an enormous amount of potential in that uh, to tackle the, um, the obesity epidemic uh, that we've got. So uh, we should, although that might not have been a very good uh, example you were, you were giving, the, the, the concept of giving people uh, the, the encouragement uh, to do these things. And this is where the, um, the role of the third sector is, is critical because there are so many opportunities for the third sector already, uh, already providing these opportunities to, to people and far more opportunities into the future for the third sector to play a really big role in making these kind of non-medication based interventions uh, more available. You're going to need support in doing that uh, sometimes financial, sometimes other kinds of support from the third sector to make uh, from the the public sector to make that happen. And again, that all comes back down to the, these organisations standing up and being counted and giving the kind of leadership uh, that is needed. Thank you. Got a couple more yeah. questions lined up. There's a lady towards the back. If you can get your hand up again, just for the microphone coming your way, and then a lady who's a bit more towards the front afterwards. Mulvey Martin, Argyll and Butte TSI. Um, we all ag agree education is a, a, a vital part of it. And yet, the 20 words removed from the Children's Oxford Dictionary all relate to things you'd find whilst walking through a wood. These have all been replaced by IT words, which is a sedentary activity. What are we subliminally, and I can't say that word, saying to our children, and is this making it an uphill battle when it comes to improving education about health? Thank you. Um, that'll be an interesting area to touch on education piece. Uh, we'll take the next question, which is towards the front. Um, it's less a question and more a comment. Um, I'm one of those social prescribers that Scotland has in its infancy. I'm based in a GP practice in um, East End of Glasgow. Um, there's 15 of us, and I think something that's really been missing from this discussion is while we'll support people to access the, you know, the plethora of community services around them that can help improve their health and wellbeing, perhaps reduce their obesity, we also talk about the barriers to people's health improvement, and quite often that's none, none of that's been mentioned today. Income. Why are we not talking about people's income? Because I've just come from a meeting this morning in a community where we're both talking about a youth work meeting, group of agencies together, health, education and the third sector all chatting together about our strategy in that community. Um, and we have, you know, um, holiday poverty as an issue, yet young people from our community are more likely to be over overweight. So the, it's about the food pricing that is a huge issue. And I see clinicians being frustrated with their patients for eating waffles and burgers that they get from farm foods. But see, if you're on a low income, you want to guarantee something on the plate of your child at dinner time, at the end of that month or at the end of that week. I know some of my favourite fruit and veg isn't cheap. So it's about what's not just about what's available, it's about the cost of that and what people actually have in their pockets to play with. Because the people I work with, 
They know a lot of these messages. It's not just about education. They want to buy good fish, good meat, healthy fruit and veg for their children. They can't afford it, because if they do, they don't have anything left at the end of the week. So unless we increase people's incomes, nothing's going to change. Thank you very much. I'm going to stick in those two questions just now. I'll come back to you after. Um, so, together or separately, if you like, panellists, um, there was the education piece, so what can we do with education um, with the, the young generation to um, make them more skilled in, um, I guess, tackling the piece of junk environment we've talked about? And then that second piece about income and um, spending power and price driving towards unhealthy choices. Um, I'm aware in Iceland you can get five inverted commas meals for five pounds. Probably don't meet any nutritional standards, but um, can perfectly understand with a very limited income how you'd end up making those choices. Can I start off with that with you, Alison, perhaps <coughs> on that issue? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, we've we've seen in relation to alcohol the situation where you buy a unit of alcohol for 18 pence in Scotland. Um, that means that you know you can buy a bottle or a can. Uh, for cheaper than a bottle of water and that, you know that's just preposterous and I, I think you're right to highlight the, that kind of uh, interplay between the decisions that people are making um, and the disposable income that they, they have available to them so we've got to find some way of changing that equation and, and I suppose certainly in, in the case of alcohol the conclusion has been reached that the only way of doing that is by legislative intervention and from the first of May, we will have a minimum unit price. Bella, you want to come in? Yeah, thanks a lot for bringing. <laughs> thanks a lot for bringing that point about income. I think it's spot on. Um, we do definitely do need to ensure that the incomes of everybody in Scotland are adequate to access a decent diet. That has to be done. Another thing that has to be done is some fiscal interventions to rebalance our pricing system of our food system like it's crazy that ultra processed like completely nutritionally poor food is the cheap option and fresh vegetables are the expensive option that yeah that doesn't make any sense and I think this is coming back to one of the points I was trying to make earlier about we need to think about this in a systemic level at the moment we pay farmers in Scotland um, but we don't have any stipulations on that. What if we paid farmers in Scotland for the amount of people they nourished and we thought about the nutritional value of crops that we grow as well? Because at the moment, that nutritional um, value is completely compromised for productivity. Um, so I think we can do different things that means that we would lower the price of vegetables, but that needs to go alongside increasing incomes and not be one or the other. We need to do both, I think. Um, Kids outside, yeah, definitely want to see more kids outside. Not really sure what we do about it. Thank you. Um, so, Anna or Drew, I think we're on um, education or the, the price challenge as well. Uh, yes, I would just like to talk about education. Um, we know, even from our school meals campaign, we had lots of parents writing back to us and commenting, giving their um, experience of it. And they say, kids know what healthy eating is. They know they have to eat five, uh, five a day, but they don't do it. Knowing and doing is two different things. And when, you, when we think about education, maybe in slightly broader terms, because we, used to, we, we tend to think education, school, what kind of messages are kids giving at school? What are they being told about health, about risks? But isn't education watching TV? There was, there was a research very recently uh, that said that during half an hour of evening watching TV, children are exposed, exposed nine times to advertising of junk food. Isn't that education? This isn't messages that they are getting from the external world. It's not just school, it's the world uh, everywhere. So we, when we think about the balance of health messages and unhealthy messages that make us do what we do, it's, it's not even at the moment. So that's why we're asking for change in environment. So it's, it's easier to make healthier choices and we have slightly more information to, to, to make health informed choices. Any thoughts, Drew? Yeah, so if I could t turn first to education. I, I don't know if anybody here believes that the education system is designed uh, to uh, promote health. I certainly don't. My kids are at fairly average school in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, uh, the opportunities uh, for physical activity are limited. If you don't like football, 
um, or one or two other uh, sports like that, um, basically there's, there's, uh, there's nothing uh, for them. And lots of children uh, at, at these schools do uh, take almost no uh, physical activity uh, at all. Uh, my, my, my kids uh, are doing what used to be called domestic sciences now. They're real experts at making uh, apple crumble and cakes and, and biscuits, but to ask them to uh, make a really nice salad or, or something that a kind of healthy meal, they don't know uh, what, to, uh, what to do. So we've got the whole thing uh, upside down. In relation to poverty, of course, we know that poverty is getting worse in, in Scotland and in the, in the poorest communities are getting poorer. The welfare cuts agenda is really biting hard and it's going to get a lot harder uh, quite soon. Already, just in Tayside, £100 million has come out of the local economy uh, through uh, what they call welfare reform. I prefer to call welfare cuts. So the situation is deteriorating. I mean, if we're wanting to... Uh, uh, encourage people from more deprived backgrounds to eat uh, healthier foods, then we need to do something to address the point that you're uh, talking about, Gregor, uh, which is you can't buy uh, regularly um, inexpensive, uh, healthy, uh, healthy food. It's not actually as expensive as people sometimes make out, but it's not nearly as inexpensive as it should be. And yet it is fantastically easy to buy special deals on all these prepared things which are high in fat, high in sugar, high in salt and very low uh, in nutritional value. And again, as, an, as a society, we need to turn that on its head. It should be much easier, much less expensive to buy the healthier stuff and much more expensive to buy the, the stuff that's just actually making people obese. You, we can't do anything about that uh, directly, uh, but we should all be putting pressure on government. We've got the example now of minimum unit pricing around alcohol. Why don't we have minimum unit pricing uh, around calories? Why not? Uh, I don't quite know how it would be done, but it doesn't seem to be uh, you know, an, an impossible uh, objective. And we know, again, from, from public attitudes, the public are sim much more sympathetic to that kind of thing now uh, than they used to be, despite what you, the, the newspapers would tell you. Thank you, Drew and, and panel. We've got time for one last quick question directly behind you, Jenny. There's Hi, um, I'd be interested to hear from the panel about some examples of the social prescribing or social programming that you feel would address some of the issues around obesity in Scotland, and if any of them perhaps would be linked to mental health or stress. Um, in my experience, a lot of families that I work with, they, um, they are in poverty or they're experiencing deprivation, but they know very well what a healthy meal is. They know how they could cook a healthy meal and they might even be able to afford it, but they don't have the bandwidth at the end of the day to go home and do that cooking. They are under such sheer amount of stress and anxiety and perhaps depression or other issues <coughs> combated by alcoholism in some cases, that that is the barrier. Um, so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that and also some examples of good social prescribing because that would link into maybe some third sector approaches and work. Can I Drew kick off on that one? Well, uh, I'd like to kick off that, you know, I'm, I don't think any of us is ex an expert on social prescribing. We do have an expert on this in, in the room, uh, and it's the colleague there. Uh, when I was talking about social prescribing being it's an inf in its infancy, there are some fantastic examples of social prescribing going on, and in the East End of Glasgow is, is just one uh, of those. And, Gregor, I think it would be really interesting to hear from uh, the colleague across there who is actively involved in delivering yeah, uh, social prescribing. You're not too on the spot. I'm willing to say a few words. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, on the 9th of April in Glasgow we're having a whole day event on our programme to share our learning um, and we're inviting other connectors, um, our social prescribers, we don't necessarily use that language ourselves, I think there's a wee bit more, it's a bit more complex than just signposting and referring on, um, but there'll be a number of people there that will be sharing their experiences, um, you know I've been doing this role for four years, um, there'll be people across Scotland coming so I would, I would encourage anyone who's got more interest to come along with that I'm not sure I could probably give you immediate examples right now unless you want to catch me afterwards. Craig most of the people here won't be able to go to that uh, oh, but so I'm just wondering whether you could maybe give I mean for me and for everybody else uh, some examples of what you might not use the term social prescribing mm -hmm. what, what does it actually look like and what 
And what, what's the aim and, and how does it happen? Well, when we operate in a completely person-centred way, so we will quite often get a referral from a GP or a clinician of any kind, and it will be because the person is overweight, they smoke. But as you say, that is not a priority for them. When we speak to them, it's their mental health and wellbeing. It's everything else that's going on in their life. And again, some of that comes down to income. They might, you know, they might have some income, but being able to manage a budget for the week and, you know, they want non-perishable items that are going to last in their freezer, let's be really honest about this. It's not just a case of um, you know, cost, it's about ease and you're, as you say, even people that are in work, um, their, their mental health and wellbeing is, is greatly impacted by, by low income and everything else that's going on. Um, but there are amazing projects in communities and people don't, people don't know about them um, or they don't have the confidence to go along. We, we take a very slow process with people. We'll get to know them. We won't just throw services at folk. We'll get to know who that individual is so that if we do make a connection for them, it's the right connection and a connection that's more likely to last. And then there's that process of checking back in with the person that was that the right connection? Did it work? Um, and we start to see people then coming to us directly instead of their clinician for another referral if they want to try something else. They bypass the GP. They don't take up that appointment. They come directly to us because they know that we will we'll be able to support them in the way that they need. So it's very different conversations we have with people, though it's not our agenda or a health agenda. Some of that comes with it. Um, people's sense of well-being will be increased. They might not physically get better in terms of their conditions, but they'll live well for longer in terms of their mental health and well-being, and that has a huge impact as well. I think that some of that can be missed. You know, we might focus on, on outcomes and you know, decrease in HBC1 results, but it's, it's not all about that. That's a really valuable on-the-ground perspective there, and I'm sure Voluntary Health Scotland will be able to facilitate sort of sharing um, awareness of future events and work you're doing um, and possibly scaling this sort of good work up. Um, I'm going to give the last word to Alison, who wants to also mention one event coming up. Um, Gregor, I'll be cheeky and mention two. Um, <laughs> one is a, a joint event which is looking at uh, alcohol marketing and unhealthy food marketing, and it's something that we're running jointly with Obes Obesity Action Scotland. You'll find it on Eventbrite. It's in Edinburgh on the uh, Wednesday, the 14th of March at the Melting Pot. Um, it's called Leave Our Kids Alone. So if you would like to come along to that, you'd be very, very welcome. Any problems, please just get in touch uh, with uh, Alcohol Focus. And the second is about a, a joint uh, cross-party group, which uh, AFS and Ash, uh, Action on Smoking and Health, as the supporters of the cross-party group on improving health, are doing jointly with uh, VHS as the supporters of the health inequalities cross-party group. So that's an event in the Parliament um, on Tuesday, the 22nd of, uh, of May. Um, so, if you've got an interest in, in coming along to that, again, get in touch um, and you'd be most welcome. Thanks, Thanks very much, Alison. Um, luck is being pushed, but I'll give them um, <laughs> one last go. Thank yeah. you. Um, just to say that uh, Nourish, along with the whole Scottish Food Coalition, which Obviously Action Scotland are part of, um, have launched kitchen table talks. Um, so, I mentioned earlier that the Good Food Nation Bill is on the agenda for the Scottish Government, and they're planning to consult on that later this year. Um, in this kind of pre-consultation phase to kind of get everyone's ideas and to get everyone thinking about the food system, kitchen table talks are a way to gather your community together. You can do it with friends or community groups or your organisation that you work for or whoever. And uh, there's loads of information on the website, but it's basically um, discussing and coming up with your five top priorities for the food system. What are the five areas that you really care about that we need to change? And top five actions for government. Um, and there's already been uh, yeah, talks going on all over Scotland. We've got a map on our website as well. And it's been really interesting get, getting everyone's views. So I'd definitely encourage you to go away and do some kitchen table talks if you're interested. Thank you. So the bad news, unfortunately, is we do have to close this session. We're um, already over time. It's been an excellent discussion. It is a real shame to, to stop now. Um, you will be sent feedback forms, and we'd encourage you all to submit, because that does help our planning for the future. Um, I'd like to thank our panellists, who've been excellent. Um, can we have some spontaneous rapturous applause for them? Yep. Excellent. Um, and 